Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas, the Texas History Podcast. This is your host, Ken Wise. Thank you very much for tuning in to listen to some Texas history today. In fact, a million thank yous to you. I didn't uh, make a huge deal about this on social media, but this podcast has now been heard well over one million times, so I cannot thank you enough for that. You know, uh, that ain't bad for a little Texas history podcast uh, that I started for fun, and and I'm still doing it for fun. I'm not doing it for statistics or anything like that, but it is kind of fun to look up and see who's listening. We've got 152 different countries in which this podcast has been downloaded and uh, several thousand past the one million mark. So thank you very much for listening to Wise About Texas. I'm going to keep doing it as long as you keep listening. I want to give you an example of why I enjoy this so much. You know, the last episode I put out was a bonus episode about the opening of the Texas Historic Commission's newest project, Via de Austin, a recreation of part of the capital of Austin's colony. And I met a listener named Jim, walked up to me, said he'd heard the podcast. That's why he was there. And he had driven all the way from Canyon Lake just to be there. I was there for a couple hours in the courthouse and uh, he came there to meet me and talk a little Texas history. I really enjoyed meeting him. And uh, that's why I'm doing this. So I get a lot of emails from y'all every week. Keep up coming. I love to hear your stories. I especially love your episode suggestions. And I've got the list uh, going. I've got hundreds and hundreds of potential topics and stories that y'all want to talk about. So I'm really looking forward to that. And I love hitting the road and driving around this state. So if you've got a group that wants to meet, you want to organize a Texas history event or have me speak to a group, I'm more than happy to do that. I do that dozens of times a year. It's a lot of fun. And uh, when it comes to preserving the special singularity of the state of Texas. It's all of our responsibilities. So uh, thanks again for listening, and I look forward to meeting you in the very near, near future. All right, so this is part three of the Indian Trial series uh, that I've been doing. In the middle of this series, the article on the Indian Trial that I wrote has been published. It's published in the Texas Supreme Court Historical Society Journal. So you can go to www.texascourthistory.org. That's texascourthistory.org. And the latest issue of the journal will have this and other great articles. And it all centered around uh, Native American issues because it was uh, Indian Heritage Month in November. So check it out. Uh, The article will read very familiar as I tell the story of the Indian trial. So let's go back to 1870s Texas and get wise about Texas. All right, well, I think we ought to start with a little recap of where we are. We ended the last episode in Jacksboro. Uh, The Warren Wagon Train raid had occurred in May of 1871. The uh, three Indian chiefs, Satank, Satanta, and Big Tree had been arrested at Fort Sill. Satank um, committed suicide by soldier on the way to Jacksboro. Satanta and Big Tree have now been transported to Jacksboro to stand trial under Texas criminal law for the Warren Wagon Train raid. Lowry Tatum, the Quaker Indian agent, coincidentally the day before that Warren Wagon Train raid occurred, had sent a letter to his boss, uh, Quaker Indian agent Enoch Hogue, saying that the Kiowa and Comanche were not able to be controlled and maybe if we subjected them to the due process of the justice system of the United States, it would impress upon them the importance of civilization and um, would end the raid and help them to make peace. But this is all against the backdrop of Grant, President Grant's Quaker peace policy and the big government welfare program where the Indians were supposed to get uh, rations every so often of food, clothing, equipment, that sort of thing. Sometimes they did and sometimes they didn't because those big government programs, as they always seem to be, were at the very least inefficient and at worst corrupt. So that was causing some problems. Um, and the Indians were doing 
uh, what they knew how to do, and that was to raid down in Texas. The citizens of Texas were appealing to the federal government to do something. This is during Reconstruction, kind of toward the end of Reconstruction, uh, begging the federal government to do something. General Sherman thought, well, maybe they're Concerns are a little bit overblown, so he decided to come to Texas and tour the forts, which he did. And, of course, cross to the plain right by the raiding party that's the subject of this story the day before or the morning of the actual raid. Um, uh, And then General Sherman saw firsthand what the problem really was. So they arrested the chiefs and they sent them to Jacksboro to trial, and that's where we begin. Now, the trial was going to occur in the 13th Judicial District. The judge was a guy named Charles Soward, and Judge Soward was going to put him to trial in the old sandstone courthouse in Jacksboro, Texas. Now, I've got a picture of it that I'll try to remember to post, but um, that courthouse doesn't exist anymore. But nevertheless, they were going to try him in Jacksboro, and the citizens of Jacksboro didn't really want that to occur. Uh, In fact, some lawyers from the district drafted a petition to Judge Seward asking him not to hold the trial in Jacksboro. And it was sent about a month after the raid. Here's what the petition said. I'll just read it to you. To the Honorable Charles Seward, Judge of the 13th Judicial District, State of Texas, we, the undersigned members of the bar, practicing attorneys, most respectfully request and petition your honor not to hold the next ensuing term of district court at Jacksboro, Jack County, Texas. Now, they're not specific there about the Indian trial. They just don't want to go to Jacksboro. So they continue and state as reasons, therefore, that it is well known in the indisputable fact that the county of Jack and the whole country between this place, they're writing from Weatherford and Jacksboro, is to an unusual and very dangerous extent infested with large bands of hostile Indians. And that on this account, travel between this and Jacksboro is unusually dangerous, that owing to the great number of Indians in this county, we do not think it would be humane and just to force litigants and jurors of Jack County to leave their families in attend court. We therefore hope your honor will not hold said at Jacksboro. And it's signed by eight lawyers, one of whom is SWT Lanham, who we will hear about in a few minutes. So they did not want court held at Jacksboro. Judge Seward said, no, it's going to happen anyway, and we will have this trial. On July 4th, the grand jury convenes and indicts both Satanta and Big Tree for murder. Uh, Lanham, or excuse me, the district attorney, the prosecutor is going to be SWT Lanham, who signed that petition not to have court at Jacksboro. But we need defense lawyers. So Judge Seward appointed J.A. Wolferk to represent Big Tree and Thomas Ball to represent Satanta. And let me tell you about these guys. Wolferk was born in Kentucky and went to law school at the University of uh, what we Texans say Louisville, but all my many friends from Kentucky say Louisville. And uh, he came to Texas. He was elected young county clerk at some point and later served in the Civil War as a colonel. He was wounded and captured during the Civil War. He returned to Louisville afterwards and practiced law. He came back to Texas and went into the cattle business and the law practice in Weatherford. So that was J.A. Wolferk. Thomas Ball was a native Texan. He was born in Huntsville, uh, son of a Methodist minister. Uh, His father was president of the Andrew Female College in Huntsville. Um, He lost both his parents by the age of six. Uh, He went to law school at the University of Virginia, came back to Texas. He was mayor of Huntsville for a time, He had a law practice in Huntsville. Later, after this trial, he ended up moving to Houston, and he actually ran for governor. He was a prohibition candidate, a dry, they called him then. And uh, he ran for governor. He lost to Paul Ferguson, James Ferguson, in 1914, uh, despite being endorsed by President Woodrow Wilson and William Jennings Bryan. He was later, uh, he was also served in Congress, but he, after Congress lobbied for uh, port funds for the Port of Houston and played a large role in that. So uh, there was a small railroad town northwest of Houston named Peck, and they changed it to honor Thomas Ball and called the town Tom Ball. So my 
friends uh, not too far from where I'm recording this up in Tomball. That's how your town got its name. So they are appointed to represent Satanta and Big Tree. And the uh, lawyers, the defense lawyers moved to try the Indians separately, which was granted. And then Seward picked a jury. All of this occurred, uh, indictment on July 4th, all of this occurred on July 4th. And they were ready to begin the trial on July 5th. So justice was certainly moving swiftly in Jack County. Now, I have one resource that has, supposedly has, the names of the jurors. So let me read the last names of the jurors in case anybody listening might have a relative who was actually on this jury. Uh, Williams, who became mayor of Jacksboro. Cameron, Johnson, Verner, V-E-R-N-O-R, Cooper, Hensley, Brown, Lynn, Hart, Brown, another Brown, Bunch, and Cooley. Those were the surnames of the jurors, so uh, if you're up in the Jacksboro area and that sounds familiar to you or is your name, you've got some research to do. So the jury takes their places and the trials begin. Now, a huge crowd had gathered in the courtroom. This was the trial of the century, and it actually was very important. In American jurisprudence, it was the first time that Indians had been tried in civilian courts as uh, criminals rather than uh, dealt with as combatants. So the courtroom was crowded. Uh, it's noted that the everyone in the courtroom was heavily armed, including the jurors who sat on two long wooden benches. The witnesses that the prosecution called were Horace Jones, who was the interpreter at Fort Sill, uh, Ranald McKenzie, who was the colonel that Sherman ordered to, he was the first one on the scene of the wagon train raid. If you go back to part two, it was the surgeon in his outfit that wrote the letter that described the scene. And Thomas Brazil, and you'll remember Thomas Brazil was one of the teamsters that was attacked, and he managed to escape to Cox Mountain and straggled in severely wounded to Fort Richardson late that night to inform Sherman and everyone of the raid. Um, Now, of course, for Satanta's trial, they would also have Satanta's boastful confession that he gave to Tatum. Now, portions of the attorney's arguments were recorded by parties that were there in the courtroom. Um, The trial transcript is lost. We don't know where it is, but yeah, but... um, Some authors have said that they were there and recorded what was said. Now, you can't rely too much on this, but uh, it'll give you some of the substance and certainly some of the more memorable lines. One author commented that um, Thomas Ball gave what he called a, quote, spread eagle, close quote, but eloquent opening statement, um, referring to the Indians as, quote, my brothers, close quote, and making the argument basically that the Indians had been driven off their land steadily and repeatedly and were simply reacting as anyone would. So he, of course, he wasn't going to start talking about treaties and agreements and all that sort of thing. Um, It was also noted that the jury wasn't real sympathetic to what Ball seemed to be saying. The prosecution's closing was recorded almost in total, allegedly, and it certainly was about what you would expect uh, from Lanham. And he got up, and one one very important thing that sort of plays into the whole dynamic of this situation is Lanham got up and gave a very generous description of Satanta and Big Tree. He, here's what he said about Satanta, quote, Satanta, the veteran council chief of the Kiowas, the orator, the diplomat, the counselor of his tribe, the pulse of his race. And then he went on about Big Tree. Big Tree, the young war chief who leads in the thickest of the fight and follows no one in the chase. The mighty warrior athlete with the speed of the deer and the eye of the eagle are before this bar in the charge of the law. But in case the jury thought he was going to be, that he was actually sympathetic, he then Uh, said that those descriptions, here's what he said, so they, Satanta and Big Trees talking about, would be described by Indian admirers who live in more secure and favored lands remote from this frontier where distance lends enchantment to the imagination, where the story of Pocahontas and the speech of Logan the Mingo are read 
and the dread sound of the war whoop is not heard. Close quote. So he's appealing to the fact that uh, the jurors are in Texas and all the sympathizers with Satanta and Big Tree are off in Washington, D.C., trying to make peace. So that would have hit the jurors directly in the heart, especially since all of the jurors knew or was related to somebody that had been victimized by the Indian raids. So then he appeals directly to what the jurors would believe. And he says this, quote, We who see them today, disrobed of all their fancied graces, exposed in the light of reality, behold them through far different lenses. He calls, uh, close quote, he also, he calls Satanta the arch fiend of treachery and blood. And he calls Big Tree the tiger demon. And then he goes on to describe in some detail uh, the raid and um, all of that. And then he, he makes this comment, quote, It speaks well for the humanity of our laws and the tolerance of this people that the prisoners are permitted to be tried in this Christian land and by this Christian tribunal. Close quote. So he makes a little bit of an appeal like it almost sounds like, uh, hey, we're doing these guys a favor by subjecting them to murder charges. Well, as you might imagine, in the face of the evidence that we've covered in the last couple of episodes, it didn't take long for the jury to convict Satanta and Big Tree. In fact, the jury didn't even leave the room. They went, and there was no jury room, to be fair, but they went off to the corner of the courtroom and deliberated, and of course, um, returned a verdict of guilty for both of them. Judge Seward immediately sentenced both to death. However, the calls to commute the death sentence came almost immediately and from some very unlikely sources. Lowry Tatum wrote a letter advocating that the death sentences be commuted. Uh, He also wrote to Sherman concerning this matter. And what Tatum believed was that as long as Satanta and Big Tree remained in prison, quote, this is what he wrote in his letter, and he wrote this to Sherman, the in, quote, the Indians will hope to have them released, and thus this would have a restraining influence in their actions, close quote. So Tatum was going back to his old Quaker peace policy sort of philosophy, and, uh, saying that we could put them in prison and convict them under the laws, which would be just, but if we keep them in prison, we can use them as, as sort of bargaining chips to make sure that the Kai was stopped raiding. Well, interestingly, someone else advocated for a commutation of the sentence, and that was the judge himself. Judge Seward sent a letter to E.J. Davis right after the trial on July 10th, and he said he pointed out that, um, and this is a quote from the letter, quote, current policy of the United States toward these wild tribes is founded on supreme folly, close quote. In other words, the Quaker peace policy obviously doesn't work. Anyone who is uh, on the ground in Texas knows that. And if we can keep these Indians in prison and alive, he, like Tatum, believed that that would calm down things on the frontier. Now, E.J. Davis, for his part, and we discussed him a little bit last, uh, last episode, but he was caught. In, in kind of a vice because Reconstruction was going to end and Davis was going to face uh, the voters, all the voters of Texas. And he wasn't very popular for very good reasons. And so he wanted to do things that would engender him to the voters. But by the same token, he was a federally uh, responsible official during Reconstruction. So he had the government, the U.S. government on one side and the Texas citizens on the other. So he was caught in the middle. Well, Davis gave in and decided to commute the sentences, uh, hoping that that would have an extended effect beyond just the imprisonment of Satanta and Big Tree and calm things on the frontier. He did that on August the 2nd, so it was uh, very quickly after the trial. Now, he knew there'd be a backlash from the residents, but what he wrote in the commutation was, He declared that Satanta and Big Tree's actions were not murder under Texas law, but rather they were an act of, quote, savage warfare, close quote. So what he did 
was try to cast Satanta and Big Tree as uh, enemy combatants, and therefore the responsibility not of the Texas criminal law, but rather the United States government and the military. So he was trying to throw the blame on the federal government rather than uh, on him. Sherman, however, was not impressed, nor was he in favor of this. Uh, He never really was in favor of this. He acquiesced um, to sort of go along with what he perceived as the momentum. And by momentum, I mean the desire to try uh, the Indians in civilian courts. He wrote uh, a letter around the time. He said that if if uh, the Indians were allowed to remain free, uh, quote, no life would be safe from Kansas to the Rio Grande, and no soldier will ever again take an Indian prisoner alive, close quote. But when he learned that Davis had commuted the sentences for, that the jury had handed down, here's in another letter, here's what he wrote. Quote, Satanta ought to have been hung, and that would have ended the trouble. He ought never to be released. As to Big Tree, I do not deem his imprisonment so essential, though he ought to keep Satanta company. So he sort of uh, reflected what I had said in part two, which is that Satanta was uh, a war chief. He would always be a war chief. He wanted to maintain that status. But Big Tree, as a young chief, might have had hope uh, to reform. So Satanta and Big Tree head off to Huntsville. They checked in in November 1871. I happen to know their prisoner numbers were 2107 and 2108. Big Tree went to work in the prison shop. He would uh, plating chairs. I don't know if he did anything else, but I know he did that. Satanta, however, remember, was very proud. He was a chief, and he didn't do any work. Uh, In fact, there was a northern writer that came down, and he wrote an article for Scribner's Monthly. He was allowed to visit the two chiefs. And here's what this author said. He said that Satanta welcomed the author, quote, with as much dignity and grace as if he were a monarch receiving a foreign ambassador, close quote. No doubt that's exactly how Satanta felt about himself. Well, I guess that leaves the question of did it work? Did the putting the chiefs through the criminal trial process and then commuting their death sentences to life in prison calm the frontier? Well, no. Um, During the fall and winter after the trial, the Comanches continued to raid. Now, the Kiowa were quiet. Um, There was an interview that an author did with a Kiowa named Hunting Horse. And Hunting Horse, I don't believe, was on the Warren wagon train raid, but he was alive during the time. And here's what Hunting Horse said about the Kiowas not raiding in response to Satanta and Big Tree's imprisonment. Quote, the Kiowa slowed down on the raids, but their minds were on it, close quote. So they weren't going to stop raiding. They were just stopping for now. And, of course, since the Comanches were still on the warpath and were still raiding, finally the Kiowas couldn't stand it anymore. And in the spring of 1872, uh, they resumed the raiding. There was a Kiowa chief, Big Bow. He attacked another wagon train. Seventeen people were killed in that attack. That was April 1872. Um, they were pursued by the cavalry. Two cavalrymen were killed. During that chase, there was one horse stealing expedition where the Comanches actually led it, but two young Kiowa boys went on it and were killed. Um, there was a, a deeper raid deeper into Texas along the Brazos River, a uh, raid led by the Kiowa chief White Horse. They attacked a man named Lee. Actually, he was sitting on his porch and they shot him out of his chair on his porch and then stormed the house and, and went through the normal raiding process, killing. Uh, the wife, several children, capturing a couple of other children. It was very brutal. Um, And, of course, Lowry Tatum, in response to all this, was just beside himself. He urged the military to go arrest the raiders. The military wouldn't do it. They'd already tried that once. Um, And so Tatum took a little bit different tactic. What he did was convene a council, and to the council he invited representatives from what was called at the time the Five Civilized Nations. Those were the Cheyennes, Arapahoes, Caddo's, Wichita's, and Delaware's. And Tatum thought, okay, here's what I'll do. I'll get these representatives from the Five Civilized Nations. They can come meet with the Kiowa, and they can calm them down and tell them how much better it is not to do this, et cetera, et cetera. So sort of an extension of the peace policy. Well, uh, the council didn't go well. Uh, The Kiowa were not calm. In fact, they were fairly arrogant. They demanded that Fort Sill be disbanded. All U.S. troops 
be removed from the area. They also demanded that the re- their reservation be extended from the Missouri River on the north to the Rio Grande on the south. So not only did they not want to stop what they were doing, they actually wanted to possess Texas. So you can imagine how that went over. Um, but they also said that the Kiowa would make peace only after Satanta and Big Tree were released back to the tribe. So you can see what the imprisonment really was. The the um, Some of the authorities thought, well, this is going to calm everything down, but what the Kiowas viewed it as is an act of war. And so, um, and, and when the Kiowas made all these demands at this council, the U.S. Indian Department, now these are the folks in Washington, D.C., they actually thought that it indicated that it was working. Uh, some of the Quaker agents were writing back and forth to each other and one, an agent named Cyrus Bede wrote a letter to Enoch Hogue, who was Tatum's direct supervisor. Here's part of his letter says, quote, everything indicates the best feeling toward the government on the part of the Indians. Close quotes. So I don't know where he got that, but that letter, that particular letter got into the hands of General Philip Sheridan and Sheridan wrote a note on it. And this is what Sheridan's wrote note about Cyrus Bede said, quote, the writer of the within communication is a little too simple for this earth, close quote. Uh, So the military guys knew that the Quaker Indian agents, with the possible exception of Tatum, had no idea of what was really going on. Against the backdrop of these events, there were discussions being had in Washington, D.C. over whether to try to use the release of Satanta and Big Tree as a bargain for peace. So you can imagine how Tatum felt about this as he watched everyone around him uh, basically ignore what he knew to be the truth. Tatum knew for for a fact that Satanta could not keep anyone else from raiding because he never had. And even if he could do that, he wouldn't. Tatum knew knew the Indians very well. And, of course, nobody in Washington, D.C. had any idea. Nevertheless, those discussions started. Uh, The Indian Department decided that a tour of Washington, D.C. would very much impress hostile Indian tribes and that they would then be interested in final peace. Um, The Kiowa, of course, said, yeah, we'll go to Washington, but only if you give us proof that Satanta and Big Tree are okay. And so arrangements were made, and Satanta and Big Tree were allowed to leave Huntsville, the penitentiary, and meet the Washington-bound Indian delegation. They did that in the eastern part of the Indian Territory. And the it did have an effect on the Kiowa. They were very happy to see him. And um, the and Satanta and Big Tree made it back to prison without any incident. But here's somebody that was left out of this whole scenario, Governor E.J. Davis. Nobody told him, nobody in Washington told Davis that they were thinking about using Satanta and Big Tree's release as a negotiating tool. Well, that's pretty important because Tanta and Big Tree were convicted of violations of Texas law. They were in Texas custody in a Texas prison. The federal government had nothing to say about it. Yet, negotiations continue. In fact, they not only continued, but the federal government essentially promised the Kiowa that Tanta and Big Tree would be released, and they were going to try to get the best terms they could get. Well, Sherman found out about that, of course. He was based in Washington and was absolutely incensed. He knew these chiefs, and he knew the Kiowas. He wrote a letter to the Secretary of Interior, a guy named Delano, and uh, here's what he said. He was talking about the moment when Satanta boasted about leading the Warren Wagon Train raid. Sherman writes, quote, I ought to have shot him on the spot. But out of great respect for the law, I caused his arrest, close quote. He also told Delano in the same letter that if you release Satanta, it would be, quote, worse than murder, close quote. He also said this, uh, summing up Satanta, as I'm sure many would have, quote, I know the man well. With irons on his hands, he is humble and harmless enough. But on a horse, he is the devil himself, close quote. Well, that pretty much accurately describes Satanta. Eventually, they had to tell Davis. So they tell Governor Davis what's going on, and Davis is uh, not 100% against the the release, but made many additional demands beyond which the government had negotiated, which, you know, 
maybe the government should have, uh, federal government should have involved Davis. And Davis was still caught, of course, between the federal government and uh, the people of the state of Texas. Uh, Enoch Hogue weighed in at this point, and he understood Davis's situation. Enoch Hogue, uh, the Quaker Indian agent, um, got with President Grant, got with Secretary Delano, and used them to try to pressure Davis into releasing Satanta and Big Tree, and finally he did. He agreed to the release. Uh, he agreed to release him. Now we're in October 1873. Now, by this time, Tatum had been had, had enough of all of this and got fed up and he quit. Um, but he knew, he heard about the release, and he knew uh, that this would be a bad result. Tatum wrote a memoir um, of his time as an Indian agent, and here's what he wrote. Quote, to give the Kiowas cause to believe that their raiding had compelled the white people to release their chiefs would only be a stimulus to them to continue hostilities, close, close quote. So Tatum, who knew the Indian culture the best, fully understood that if you lead with diplomacy, you are communicating weakness to this particular cultural tradition. And uh, he shouldn't have been the only one to understand that. Actions would show that to everybody else. But he knew it, and, and he predicted it. So we'll see what happens. Um, the federal government, of course, just wanted to let him go in return for promises uh, and show good faith, et cetera, et cetera, the typical diplomatic stuff. So Davis shows up at Fort Sill, uh, the, uh, brings Satanta and Big Tree. They convene a council. Uh, Davis explains to everybody that he is only going to parole Satanta and Big Tree. This is not a release, and that they would be rearrested if the raids didn't stop. One Kiowa chief, Lone Wolf, said, We will do as you say. Another Kiowa chief, Kicking Bird, said, Turn over the chiefs, meaning Satanta and Big Tree, and we will quit raiding in Texas. Enoch Hogue, who was there, and he should have kept his mouth shut, but he piped up that he didn't think the Kiowas had been raiding in Texas. So um, at that point, Davis, it almost blew the deal. Uh, but Davis said, I am in control of this situation, and I'm going to do what's best for the people of Texas. So he agreed, Davis agrees to release them to the post commander. Hogue insists that he can keep the peace if these chiefs are released, and that was it. So... Let's see how it worked. Well, it worked for about a week. One week after the chiefs were, Satanta and Big Tree were released, a large party of Indians attacked three men in Wichita County. Now, the men got away. But then, on October the 16th, Indians attacked another ranch in the area, killed a man. On the 18th, a scouting party ran into two parties of Indians, but managed to escape. On October 30th, a man named Baines sent this letter to Governor Davis and informed Governor Davis that uh, the Indians, quote, had been depredating on the people of Palo Pinto County for the past 10 days, close quote. Well, this caused an uproar on the reservation. I mean, not a week after these chiefs were released, these raids uh, went forward. The Indian Department in Washington ordered all rations to cease no more rations would be passed out. Well, you could imagine how that, uh, the effect that had on the Indians. The, uh, the raids were clearly Comanche raids, at least, uh, and the Comanches claimed that the Kiowas were participants also. The Kiowas denied participating. Um, the chief Lone Wolf that I mentioned earlier, he suggested that it was the Comanches' own fault. They'd taken their chances. They ended up dead. Um, However, a few days later, after he made that claim, one of Lone Wolf's own sons was killed in a raid in Texas, so he wasn't exactly truthful. Um, Kicking Bird tried to defend it all by saying, well, it was the government that had broken the agreement, um, even though the, by, and I assume he's meaning about the rations, but of course that was in response to the raiding that had already occurred. One interesting thing when you read these accounts that I think is telling is there's lots of references from the Indian side um, to the difference between what they call often a land of peace and Texas. 
And so I think there was a fundamental misunderstanding on the Indians' part that um, not raiding in the Oklahoma, what is now Oklahoma was different than not raiding in Texas, that they could raid in Texas as long as they didn't raid in what is now Oklahoma. In fact, Satanta, uh, before all of this wagon train stuff, at one point had said, you know, to, the, to Lowry Tatum, he said, we don't anticipate raiding in uh, the Indian Territory, but we do anticipate raiding in Texas. So there was clearly uh, a disconnect there. In any event, uh, everything Sherman had predicted was coming exactly true. He was called before Congress to testify about the situation. He reiterated his views in the testimony that Satanta should have been executed and that Davis had made a terrible mistake by releasing the chiefs. Well, when Davis got wind of what Sherman had said, he wrote a nasty letter to Sherman in February 1874. He claimed uh, to Sherman that Sherman should have assumed jurisdiction over Satanta and Big Tree because the military had arrested him and had arrested him in Indian Territory, which was under federal control, and had arrested him as military combatants rather than common criminals. Well, <laughs> Sherman uh, shot this letter back. He said, quote, to Davis, quote, you are in error in supposing that I had any authority whatever to execute the Kiowa chiefs at Fort Sill or to order their trial by a military court or commission. I had authority to do exactly what I did, viz, with the assent and approval of the agent Tatum on the spot to send them to the jurisdiction of the court with authority to try and punish. And then he said this to Davis, I believe that Satanta and Big Tree shall have their revenge if they have not already had it, and that if they are to have scalps, that yours is the first that should be taken. Close quote. So uh, Sherman made his point, I'd say. The only thing Davis had left to do was beg the Federals to uh, do something about that. He tried to suggest that maybe Texas would raise a regiment. Sheridan wouldn't, General Sheridan wouldn't let that happen. Sheridan did encourage an offensive campaign. Sherman was on board for that. And the point of this is that Sherman finally understood, finally realized, he understood, but he finally realized that the only way the conflicts with hostile tribes was going to resolve was war. Every other option had tried and failed at this point. And while these debates were occurring, uh, the raids continued. We had the Second Battle of Adobe Walls during this time. There was another raid uh, that was led by Mamonte, the same uh, shaman that participated in leading the Warren Wagon Train raid. Uh, he kept his head down and kept out of the newspaper pretty much, but he was still around. Um, they went to the exact same place on this raid where the Warren Wagon Train was attacked. One source said that the war party actually visited the grave of the Comanche that had been killed in the Warren Wagon Train raid. And they saw two guys crossing that same plane, only these guys were Texas Rangers. So they got after them. Uh, the Rangers fought back, fought back well. One Ranger was killed. However, Lone Wolf was on this raid. This was uh, Lone Wolf's idea because he wanted to avenge the death of his son. And he avenged it by killing that Texas Ranger. The Ranger's name was David Bailey. On that raid, they fled. The Kiowas fled back toward the Red River, and uh, none other than our buddy Enoch Hogue actually tried to get them back on the reservation without anybody knowing they had been gone. So Hogue was really uh, an outlier in this situation, working against the federal government and against everyone else. Meanwhile, raiding continues. Um, it is hard to determine to what extent Satanta was involved. Um, Satanta admitted later being involved in some of the raids. He claimed he didn't fight, which, of course, is one of the normal claims that he would make when he got caught. Um, he claimed that he was just training young warriors. Same thing he said at first about the Warren Wagon Train raid. Uh, but finally, uh, October 1874, Satanta and Big Tree go to the Cheyenne Agency instead of Fort Sill because they wanted to avoid everyone at Fort Sill. But they were immediately arrested. And uh, Satanta was sent, uh, they were both sent back to prison. This time it was a little different. There wasn't any sign that they were going to get out. And Satanta started to realize this. And he did not do well in prison. They say 
He was often found staring north toward the Red River. Finally, on October 10, 1878, he asked a prison official if there was any chance he would be released. The official said no. The next day, Satanta climbed to a second floor balcony, threw himself off, and died a few hours later. Satanta was buried in the prison cemetery along uh, with other prisoners that nobody claims. Big Tree, as things died down and Sheridan and Sherman's uh, had gone on offense and, and launched what came to be called the Red River War, which was successful, a Big Tree was released from prison. And he actually be- converted to Christianity and became a Baptist deacon. He prospered and became well-liked and well-respected in the Indian community and, and the uh, white community. And he didn't. He died in 1929. And interestingly, uh, some of Satank's children also converted to Christianity and became active in the Baptist church. Well, I don't do uh, normally a lot of commentary, uh, but this is a very interesting uh, historical time period. You had interesting personalities in Tatum, Hogue, Sherman, and certainly Satank, Satanta, Big Tree, Kicking Bird. Uh, you had a very interesting set of circumstances because this was post-Civil War, and during the Civil War, the frontier went back from west to east due to Indian raids and the lack of frontier protection, so there was opportunity. Uh, the Indian raiding was not unusual. It was something that had uh, occurred ever since the Plains Indians had been encountered. You had the federal government trying to uh, impose some sort of order on a frontier with which its officials were not very familiar. And you had uh, the attempts to impose a legal system on a frontier where military action was often necessary. And behind all of this was the uh, collision of two very, very different cultures. One from the United States side, uh, used to the rule of law, and what that means for diverse peoples to live together under a common set of rules, uh, and the other, a warrior culture, unchanged for hundreds of years. And all of those things came together in this incident. And I, there are some wonderful lessons uh, to learn from it. Hopefully this has been instructive. Some of the ones that obviously jump out are uh, this notion of trying um enemy combatants of a sort under uh, civilian laws. That's something that's going on as I record this podcast um, in a different context. And the other is uh, the idea of how cultures um, can assimilate one to the other, especially when one is a warrior culture. And that's something else that's in our news headlines almost every day if you look for it. So this is a very interesting situation. Uh, There was a lot of sadness involved, but, you know, life on the Texas frontier in the late 19th century was violent, and uh, that's just the way it was. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of Wise About Texas. Thank you very much for listening today. I hope you'll find us on Instagram at Wise About Texas, also on Twitter at Wise About Texas. Like and share the Wise About Texas Facebook page. If you get a minute, leave a five-star review. That helps people find the show. And if you want to support the preservation and promotion of Texas history, find us at www.patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Wise About Texas, and you can support the show. Thanks again for listening. Go out and do something for Texas today. And until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.